Okay. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for saving us and loving us. Thank you for assembling us together to be blessed, thoroughly blessed, by receiving more of you today. Thank you, Lord, for that. I ask that each and every one of us receive the blessings, the revelations that you, the, uh, that you <laughs> show yourself to each and every one of us in a way that we can comprehend and understand. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Savior, amen. amen. Okay, we're going to look at the entire chapter of Luke 15 today, and I'm going to read it first through just to give you the, the uh, uh, text. Uh, okay, Luke chapter 15, verse 1. You can follow along with, if you want to on your... On your uh, uh, sheet. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners toward to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake the, and Jesus spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? And go after that which was which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods <clears throat> that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and that citizen sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many servants of my father's have bread enough and to, eat and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way, Excuse me, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said unto him, Thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. 
And he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive, and was lost, and is found. Amen. Okay. Now the notes are, of course, uh, an expansion, an amplification of a text. And it starts, uh, and the title of this message is about our salvation and the prophecy, a mighty famine. All right. And so the black face is, is the actual text and uh, everything in the light is, uh, 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 most of the stuff is commentary. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. And they drew near unto him, that's unto Jesus, all the publicans, and publicans were the tax collectors. And sinners, uh, neither one of them are really nice people. Well, let's look and see what sinners were. Our first footnote. Sinners means in the Greek to miss the mark so as not to share in the prize. What is the prize? The prize is heaven. And the sinner is, uh, uh, the definition is in the Greek to miss the mark, to not, to not make it. To miss the mark and not to share in the prize, to err, especially morally to sin, to offend, to offend God, okay? So go back up now to where we left off. And, and then drew they near unto him, all the publicans, tax collectors, and the sinners, for to hear, for to understand him. And the Pharisees, and the, <coughs> my, my voice is obviously going here, but we'll work. <laughs> okay. The Pharisees, uh, in, in the Hebrew, a Pharisee was uh, the separated ones. They were uh, with the priesthood. And that priest kind of separated himself from all those sinners, you know. I'm a priest, and you're, you're a sinner. That's a separated. And they're actually in the Hebrew, that's what a Pharisee means, the separated ones, okay? That's how it was, and to some degree still is. They drew near to him, all the publicans, the tax collectors, and the sinners, for to hear, to understand him, and the Pharisees and scribes, scribes were the writers, they copied uh, the verses and such, and scribes murmured, the all, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured. Now wait a minute, look at what murmured means. In the Greek it means to complain throughout a crowd, grumbled. So they were murmuring throughout a whole crowd, when other people were overhearing, of course, that's what they were doing it for. They mumbled and were complaining. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, <coughs> saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Well, how about that? That's sharing, isn't it? When you eat with someone, you're sharing. That's why we have a fellowship meal afterwards. We share, okay? All right. This man says here, this man receives sinners and eateth with them. They're complaining about that. When in fact, uh, receiveth actually means, in the Greek it means to have intercourse with. It means in a type of, um, is intimate with is, is the implication. Okay. This man is intimate with sinners, and he eats with them. He actually shares with them. <laughs> and he does share with us, doesn't he? He shares himself, okay, with sinners. But they thought it was a bad thing. That's my point. They thought it was a bad thing. And he eats with them. And Jesus spake this parable. And the parable is in the Greek a fictitious narrative of common life conveying a moral, okay? And Jesus spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? Now let's go back a bit. So, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them? Let's look at the second footnote here. Commentary. If he lose one of them. How? How? Why? Why would he lose? Well, how would he lose a sheep? He's a shepherd, okay? He would lose a sheep because the sheep wandered off on its own. And that's what sheep do. 
they wander off on their own, you know. Right? That's why you've got to kind of keep an eye out and keep them herded in. Right? I have that same problem here at the, at the Rush Commission. Got to keep my staff kind of herded in because they wander off on their own, okay? But, okay, because, uh, why, does he, why would he lose, might lose one of them? Because they wander off on their own, okay? Wandered off on its own. And why come? The sheep was not paying attention to the shepherd. When a sheep wandering around the flock is not paying attention to the shepherd, just doing his own thing, and he just wanders off like this, and the shepherd and, the, and all the flock are all going one direction, he's going another direction. Sheep wander off, okay? Again, if he loses one of them, why? How? Because the sheep wandered off uh, on its own. That is, the sheep was not paying attention to the shepherd. The sheep became, and the pe sheep became distracted by the world. And that's what happens because there's all kind of stuff going on out there, and, and the sheep just not paying attention to the shepherd, distracted by the world. And that's descriptive of a person among the thorns. That's the source of the seed parable. A person who, by the cares, riches, and pleasures of his life. He just cares means distractions of his life, of, 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 the, of the life. Okay. That's the profile of a backslider. That's what a backslider does. They, they, they're wandering with the flock and they're doing good with the flock and then they just start not paying attention to the shepherd and the other things, they start looking at the world and they just kind of bunch, 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 wander, right, right, and they're gone. Now, my point is this. A sheep is a sheep. And the Lord said here, what is it? A man have, uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, where'd he go? Uh, uh, what man of you having a hundred sheep? And th that man would be the Lord having a hundred sheep, okay? He has a hundred sheep. Now one of them wanders off, okay? And so my point is, is he saved? Yep, sure is. The Lord says he had a hundred sheep. He owns a hundred sheep. He saves. Those sheep people are saved. A backslider isn't lost. He's just a backslider, okay? But he's saved. Real important to know here about that. that, that uh, you, you know, none of us are perfect, uh, not, including me. None of us are perfect. We backslide. Pretty much all the time, one way or another, this thing and that thing and so on and so on. But are we saved? Yep, we're still saved. How come? Well, let's look here and I'll see what's happening. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness? And the wilderness is uh, the, the third footnote. Let's go to the third footnote and see what the uh, wilderness is. In the Greek, it's lonesome, by implication, waste. It's a desert, it's desolate, it's solitary, it's a wilderness. It's the world, what we're talking about now, okay? The wilderness is the world. Going back up and seeing what we're saying here. What men of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost? Well, why would he do that? The shepherd's got a hundred sheep, and one of them is lost, is wandered off into the, into the world, okay? And he leaves the ninety and nine in the world and goes after the, what does that say? Why would the shepherd leave the ninety and nine? They're protected. He's, he's not going to leave them uh, uh, and to get destroyed by the world. They're, they're automatically protected. Why? They're saved. They're born again. They're protected. That's why he can leave the 99 in the wilderness, not worry about them because they're protected, because salvation, your salvation protects you. Okay? And he can go after the, the one that's lost, okay? Trying to bring it back in. And he spake this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the 99 in the wilderness? and go after that which is lost, which has wandered off. Why? Because he wasn't paying attention. Like my staff. I've used my staff as an example. My staff, lots of them don't pay attention. They're just kind of like, hard to get them out of the world. They're still in the world, kind of thinking worldly thoughts and everything. And they, 
They, they can't, can't uh, uh, and they can't start wandering off. All the time they do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm all the time. Well, here, this, uh, this okay, bring, bring them back. That's what a shepherd does. Brings them back in. Brings them back in. Takes care of them, okay? Now, those, she those sheep, those sheep that wander off, let's say they stay out, out for a while, okay? They're saved. They're born again. They're born again. They're just backsliding. Backsliding. Okay, it does not leave the 99 in the wilderness in the world and go after that which is lost until he finds it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now let's look at that, uh, 4 and 5. He layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. Footnotes 4 and 5. Commentary, laying it on his shoulders. Sometimes he lays it on his shoulders after breaking one of its legs. Yes! After breaking one of his legs, that's, uh, I, you, you find that if you look at there's a book I'm recommending you read. It's A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. And he talks about that. Have you been a shepherd? This is a very famous, well-known book in Christian circles. All right, And he talks about having been a shepherd. He says that. And sometimes, you, because this sheep keeps wandering off. The sheep keeps wandering off. And he pull them, pull them back, and he chases them down and pull them back. And he wanders off again. And pretty, so he's habitually a wanderer. So what you do... Well, what normally you do with a wanderer is you, you catch them and put them on your shoulders and bring them back. What does that, what does that do? When you're on the, the shoulders of the shepherd, you're totally intimate with the shepherd, okay? All right? And you're learning to be close and intimate with the shepherd. All right? You're learning to follow the shepherd, to lead the shepherd, to look at the shepherd. Because your big problem was you weren't looking at the shepherd. You were thinking about your own junk going on out there. That's what you were seeing, all right? Now, but you get one of those one of those sheep. This is what Phil Keller said about his his shepherding experience. You get one of those sheep that keeps wandering off all the time. You break his leg. Then you put him on your shoulder, and now you can, now the shepherd carries him around for a long time. And while he's doing that, that sheep learns to be dependent upon the shepherd. So now, after that sheep is healed up, you put him down. He's going to be with the shepherd close because he's been he's learned that the shepherd will take care of him. But the only way he could stop him from going out, he had to break a leg. That's what they do in sheep circles. Isn't that interesting? That's not a, that's not a made up story, that's how it goes. How we do that here, is I get one of the, one of the sheep in the, in, in, uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the mission, and. Eventually, I just when I can't I can't deal with them anymore. I just let them go. I, I let the world do that to him, <laughs> and he gets beat up in the world pretty bad. <laughs> and then he then he's more willing to listen. People forget. I get people coming on staff, and they're on staff a bit, and they forget how it was out in the world. Okay. And they think, well, that's more attractive, and I can go back, and I can do this, that, and so on, and so on, and everything else, and whatever. But when they get out there, pfft, no way. No way, because if they're a real sheep, all right, they belong with the shepherd. A, she a, a, a real Christian belongs with Jesus, with the, with the, right? A, a born-again Christian belongs with God, with Jesus. And if they're real, and they're out there in the world, that ain't the place to be anymore. They've been changed. Their attitude, their thoughts, and their mind, and their thinking has been changed now. All right, and they learn that real fast out there. Because now it's oh, I'll go back here because I see my old friends and my old buddies and my old this and my old job and this thing and that thing. But they ain't the same anymore because you're a different person. You think differently than them. It's like caterpillars and butterflies. Okay, these people on the outside uh, were caterpillars. Uh, when we're natural men, and then we form a cocoon, I'll get in, uh, I'm too involved in that, and we come out of that, they'll transform, change into being butterflies, okay? But those people on the outside who aren't born again, they're caterpillars, and they don't ever change. They do the same stuff over and over and over, the same patterns, defeatist patterns, bad patterns, they've gotten in trouble in the first place, okay? And if they don't see, see, because they, what happens to us is, we change. We, we're caterpillars that are attached to the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the tree. 
we, we climb up the tree and we attach ourselves to the cross. Jesus Christ. Okay? And we're changed. And we come out of that as butterflies. As butterflies. Butterflies don't think like caterpillars. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Butterflies just don't think like caterpillars. So when I, when I, I got someone who decides he wants to go on the outside again, he goes out there and realized, hey, these people don't think like me anymore. He realizes he doesn't belong out there. I have that experience frequently after here. People leave and they want to come back. <laughs> I've got enough of that. I've, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for it. All right. So that's why, but some of them, when he gets them, rather than just put them on his shoulders and bring them back and they have that level of intimacy, if they're repeat offenders, it just breaks a leg. Now they got to stay with them for a long time. Okay. What man of you have a hundred sheep if we lose one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost and find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Oh, I didn't read it. Uh, okay, he layeth it on his shoulders. We talked about the, uh, about the breaking of the leg. Let me give you a, an example that we've just studied just recently. Remember when uh, Gideon uh, was, uh, was against, his force of 300 men were against 135,000 Midianites and, uh, and they uh, banged the, the, the trumpets and the, so forth and so on, whatever. But anyway, out of that, ha what happened? Only 15,000 Midianites survived that encounter. And they ran and they went out, uh, out of, of Palestine into, into the world, okay? They ran across the Jordan River. And Gideon followed the, those 15,000 men with his own troops. So there were 15,000 survivors from that original fight and they went out in, back into the world and, and Gideon followed, followed them and he asked for help along the way. And the first place he stopped was Succoth. And Succoth, he said, give bread to my men because we're weary and thirsty. Thir thirsty. Help us, in other words, to go. And Succoth were, were Jews, okay, who lived outside of Palestine but were Jews. And, uh, and they wouldn't give him bread. They wouldn't support the troops because they said, well, you don't, you don't have the victory with Ze of Zebun Zemunia. That's the two kings. You don't have that yet. So we're not going to support you because they'll have to come back on us. So he went on uh, to uh, uh, another place. Uh, 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 but anyway, when, G when Gideon went on and defeated uh, the, other, the remaining 15,000 uh, Midianite troops, he came back. And now, what did he do with the people in Succoth? It says, because they were saved and born again, but they wouldn't support him. He taught them with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. He taught them, the people of Succoth, with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. This does not sound good. Okay? This does not sound good. So we have the thorny ground. Now these, so Succoth was actually, in the Sower Sowth the Seed parable, was on thorny ground. Okay? That's where the thorns and briars of the wilderness are. And what, what happens is here, let's, let's go to, uh, I didn't finish this uh, breaking on his shoulders commentary. He layeth it on his shoulders sometimes after breaking a leg, like as the uncooperative, that is sacrifice withheld, saved men of Succoth who were taught with the thorns of the wilderness and briars from Judges 8.16. It's an interesting thing. The previous messages that the Lord has given through me all relate to this message we're doing now. <laughs> it's like it's like it's just like it's like building a structure. I mean it's it's one message on top of another, on top of another, based on a lot of things in the previous message and so on up to, up the road. It's developing. Let's go back to this then. If you lose a, a one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And that means abundant joy. It means delight. Okay, Rejoicing. And when he cometh home, 
he called together his friends and neighbors. Notice that? Now he would be Jesus Christ in type. Called together his friends and neighbors. Now you have friends and neighbors, every one of you do. With whom are you the most familiar with? With whom are you the most intimate with? The friends. And they are well favored, for want of a better description, by you. Your friends are well favored. You, okay. How about your neighbors? Do you favor them the same way as you do your friends? No. They're however favored. So what we're seeing here is a distinction. It didn't say he went home and called together his friends. It said he went home and called together his friends and his neighbors. Okay, so there's a distinction. Now we're talking about Christians. Some of us are destined to be friends of God and others are kind of like neighbors a little more distant from Jesus. Aren't we so? Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of us are close to Jesus and others are more distant. Now these people with Succoth, they were more distant because they had to be taught with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. They weren't, they weren't taught and, 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 and accepted the teaching they had to be taught with thorns and briars and wounds. That's a painful lesson. That's like, that's like you go before the judge first time for an offense. Well, we'll let you that, we'll let you off, that, that, so on. Second time you go to the judge before an offense. Well, listen, you don't, we told you about that, that, so we'll put you on a little probation. You go before the judge a third time, he says, ah, that's it, buddy. Jail time for you. You ain't listening. Thorns and briars of the wilderness. Jail time. Why are you, God's in control. Any of you who've been to jail, guess what? <laughs> you haven't been listening. That's why you went to jail. He said you knew that this law was this, this law was that. Who are the laws? The laws are all based on God's law. All the laws are all based on, uh, on, on the Ten Commandments. When you break a law, Consistently, the first time you may be forgiven, the second time you may be a little probation, the third time you're going to jail. You're getting hammered. Thorns and bars of wilderness. Listen to me now. And what, what are you going to do in jail? Well, you got lots of time. All your options are gone. You just got, you got lots of time to read the Bible to get close to God because you weren't doing it before. When you're breaking out the laws of the land, God ordained laws of the land, you're, coming, you're, you're going away from God. You're going the wrong direction. And he called together his friends, that is, known well, favorably, and neighbors, known favorably, but not really well, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, share it with me. You, want to, you don't want to be a neighbor of Jesus, do you? You want to be his friend. Don't we all, if, we, if you're saying the word again, you don't want to be a neighbor. Hey, they seen you over there. Oh, you doing? That's good. I see you. you want to be his friend. You want, hey, Jesus, how you doing, man? It's nice seeing you. I'm going to talk. How do you become his friend? Well, there's a way. Right here. Read it. Become his friend. That's how. Can't do it any other way. He says, now rejoice with me, uh, share in my abundant joy, my delight. Rejoice, uh, for I found my sheep that was lost. And I say unto you, uh, that likewise joy, that's delight, shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents. And repent means to think differently, to reconsider. I should have mentioned this thing about, about, the, about the thorns here. Well, let me, let's go to footnote number five that I omitted doing. 
<laughs> talking about sex, but I'll do it now. Matthew chapter 13, 22. He that receives seed among the thorns, as he that hears, that's understands in the Greek, the word and care. He's saved. He's a saved guy. He understands it. But the care of this world, that means distractions of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, that's illusions of, of riches. What do you think a uh, 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 delusion is? You ever hear this, uh, the phrase, money will make you happy? <laughs> I heard that phrase all my childhood. That's a delusion. I had money. It didn't make me happy. No, I have no money. I'm a lot happier now than I ever was. See, delusions of riches. Choke the word. That's to strangle completely. Take by the throat. And so what's the consequence of that? The word so that although he's saved, he becometh unfruitful. He's a backslider. He becometh unfruitful. Produces no fruit. Needs to be taught. And I'm going to tell you something. Will be taught. Before he enters heaven. Will be taught. Not needs, it, uh, he needs to be, yes, but he will be taught. Now, I want to tell you this. When you enter heaven, you're going to receive the full mind of Christ. He's not going to give it to someone who's in the midst of, uh, 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 how do I say, who has no understanding. I don't know, I'm getting kind of. Every one of us will be taught. But the person who's on thorny ground is going to be taught the hardest. The hardest. Because you're saved and born again. Now, oh, but, but I, I never heard of anybody say to me, I wish I'd never been saved. I'd never been born again. I've never in my life heard that, seen it written or anything else. No one's ever said that. But there's a price to pay if you don't obey the Lord. And you'll be taught that price. You'll be taught. Expect it. Hard times are coming for many, many of us. Expect it. He that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears, that understands the word, and that carries distraction of this world, and the deceitfulness and delusions of riches. Money will make you happy. Choke the word. I mean, strangle completely. Take by the throat the word. And he, although he's saved, becomes a backslid, becomes unfruitful. He's already saved. The seed has taken root. It just bears no fruit anymore because he's all in the world. He's wandered off into the world. He's a backslider. Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents. Now, let's go to, I showed you here, this, we just talked about the biggest picture of this parable here, which is the, the world. We're talking about the world. That's the big, big picture. But there's a, a lesser big picture within the bigger picture. There's a lesser bigger picture. It's called the house. So now, the, here's the world. Now, here's the house. Now, we're going to focus on the house. Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. Either... That means or in the Greek. Either what woman, now the woman symbolizes the church, okay? Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. Let's go back up. What woman symbolizing the church having ten pieces of silver? Now let's look and see what ten pieces of silver, what that means, okay? Footnote number one, the commentary. Ten pieces of silver. Ten is a number that symbolizes complete. That means complete. This is ten, like ten commandments. That's complete. Ten, ten is complete. Okay? Now, ten pieces of silver. What's silver symbolize? Okay? Silver is the metal that symbolizes redemption, salvation. In the Bible, like two metals, two primary metals are silver and gold. Gold symbolizes God because it's pure. It, it can use it in its pure form. It's the most pure type of metal. Silver symbolizes redemption. How do we know? Ten pieces of silver represent the complete army, the redeemed of God, who are all imputed for righteousness slash saved persons. Okay? Now let's go to that footnote A there and see what that means. 
Exodus chapter 26, verse 19. And thou shalt make forty sacks. Now we're talking now about the tabernacle of Moses here. And we're talking about these boards. There's 48 priest boards. They are priest boards because there's 48 cities that God gave to the priests. 48 priest boards stand up in the tabernacle of Moses, okay? And here's, hear about them. And thou shalt make 40 sockets as shoes of silver. A socket. A socket, you remember when you go to your house or your home or whatever, you plug something into the wall into a socket, right? That plug has two prongs on the end of it that you plug in, okay? Now, the, into the socket. Now, listen to this. And thou shalt make 40 sockets that shoes of silver, metaphorically the shoes of salvation. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under 20 boards. So there's 20 boards, two sockets apiece. Two sockets under one board, priest board, for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board, priest board, for his two tenons. So each of these 48 boards for our priest boards has at the bottom of it two tenons that go into the sockets. And there are two sockets. A socket here and another socket adjoining it. So it all evens out at the bottom, okay? Those two sockets are shoes. Okay? And I shall make 40 because these are priest boards. These are lies. Priests. And I shall make 40 sockets. That's a type of shoe. Uh, that's uh, my interjection. It's a shoe of silver under 20 boards. Two sockets under one board for his two tenons and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. So, symbolically, this is the board, and here's the tenon and tenon. It's like we plug it into the socket uh, at home, okay, which are representing feet. And there's a, there's a no, these are the, uh, these are the tenons here. And there's a uh, tenon around one and a tenon around another, evening it out. You see, now why, why two? The best way to build this would have been one complete socket. Oh, I see socket, that's what I was saying. The best way to build this would have been a complete socket with a tenon in it and another tenon in it. A complete socket. But he didn't do that. God didn't do that. He made two sockets side by side. Shoes. Make sense? See what we're doing here? Let's go to the next footnote, B. And having your feet shod, this is the dining on the whole armor of God, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, the gospel of peace Having your feet shod, the Bible, the Bible says, have your feet shod, shod shoes. What kind of shoes do, uh, uh, represent the gospel of peace? The Old Testament and the New Testament. That's salvation. Having your feet shod with the gospel of peace. One, one tenon, two tenons, representing salvation. But this time it means Old Testament, New Testament, because it's the gospel of peace, based on salvation. All these boards stood on silver sockets all the way around, on silver sockets indicating redemption. Okay, And that's a, that's a type, uh, you can take that right through the Bible and follow that through. The silver always rep represents uh, re redemption, and gold represents God in the Old Testament. Why am I doing this? You need to know these. This is a, this is a book of uh, symbology. It's symbols. It's all symbols. Words are symbols, aren't they? Words mean something other than what they're formed, don't they? Word, words have different kinds of meanings inside them. They mean different than their form. This whole Bible, that's what it's all about. 
It's all about symbols. It's like a code. You have to understand the code to understand what's going on. If you don't know the code, you, none of this makes any sense to you. What stands for what? What symbol, symbolizes this? What symbolizes that? Don't know it. The Holy Spirit has to explain it to you. And so you have to be willing to receive it. Okay, either what woman, symbolizes the church, has ten pieces of silver. If she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and that's for more uh, illumination. Uh, she shall open the Bible, John 1, 14, which is the word, which is Jesus Christ, the word, and preach in God in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the, the she, she, doth, she doth not light a candle. Second footnote. From Psalms chapter 18, verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. From this this symbol here, we are a candle. Each of us is a candle. And in Psalms uh, uh, 20, uh, 18, uh, verse 28, is praying that the Lord my God will light my candle. And he will light my, and he lit my candle. And he lit your candle when you got saved in the morning again. That's what happened to you. Your candle got lit, okay? Inside you, your candle got lit. And the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And now your darkness, the internal darkness inside you, is being illuminated by the light of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world. And then he said, ye are the light of the world. Because you have Jesus Christ inside you too. Uh, either for, uh, what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house? and seek diligently till she find it. Sweep the house. That means thoroughly examine, cleanse. The house is the church. Thoroughly cleanse the house, the church. But the woman is the church, and we are as well. So it means cleanse ourselves as well. Cleanse ourselves as well. Let's look at... Uh, well, let's keep... Okay, okay. Thoroughly sweep the house. And that would be uh, uh, footnote number uh, number th uh, three, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself. But let a man examine himself. Examine yourself, okay? According to what, what rule? According to the Bible. Examine yourself and stand yourself up against what the Bible says. Am I doing what the Bible, am I representing the Bible properly? Am I doing what the Bible says? Am I not doing what the Bible says? And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 says as well, it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove, that's test your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except, that's unless, ye be reprobates, worthless, rejected of God. You've got to examine yourselves. That's what the woman was called to do. And she said, to, and sweep the house thoroughly, and seek that search diligently. And in Greek, that means carefully. It means full of care, diligently, till she find it. This verse is expressing the temporary loss, the absence of something, someone, or someone of great personal value. You see, it's a temporary loss. All these verses talk about our uh, these losses, okay, where the sheep was gone, that was temporary, all right? Where the piece of silver was gone, silver is your medal of redemption. So if it's 10 pieces of silver, if it's 10 men, 10 redeemed men, but it represents the army of God, all, all people who have been redeemed of God, okay? But it, it might seem like loss, but, it'll, uh, but you'll be found. If you're saved and born again, you'll come back to the fold, the sheepfold. You'll be brought back by the word of God. Once saved, always saved. There are really nearsighted people who can't see that in the Bible. That's all the Bible is explaining, explaining that to us, and all these things that we're reading today. Once saved, always saved. That's the deal. Now you're going to have some problems and, and trials and tribulations and, and wander off sometimes, but once saved, always saved. 
And when she, until she finds it, and when she, when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together. Now what these verses do in, in, in Luke chapter 15, they repeat in these different types of, di three different instances of different parables, they repeat things. Again, we're seeing friends and neighbors here, aren't we? And when she has found it, she calls her friends, which are well favored by her or by God, in the case might be, and her neighbors who are favored. Sort of like sheep and shepherds. Sheep and shepherds. You would think if there was, a, and I don't want to put it in, uh, like that, like uh, the shepherd are, are more well favored, but I think more intimate. The shepherds are more intimate with God than the sheep. You know that. That's pretty, pretty clear. I would think that would be it. Rather, I think I think I have this wrong here. It's not favored as much as it is intimate. I spell it I N T I M. I got to hear funny stuff. Intimate. Intimacy. How close do you want to be to God? Well, you can be as close as you want to be. Well, what do you mean by that? Just open the book. Now, I'd say if I start reading the Bible, I'm being pretty close to God, aren't I? I'm actually reading his word. His word is coming out of my mouth and going into my head. That's pretty intimate, isn't it? That's going inside me. That's, the, that's, the, that's intercourse in, in that sense of the word. Intimacy. But if I don't read the Bible, I'm not being intimate at all. But I still might be saved. I might dabble in it once in a while. I would be then a neighbor. But if I'm into it, the Bible, I will be a friend. Jesus said that uh, to, his, to his disciples at one time. He said, I will no longer call you servants, but I will call you friends. Friends. And see, the neighbor is a servant. Let's do it like that. In that case, the neighbor is a servant. You got to understand that you're going to come out of that body someday. And what we're doing here is we're preparing you to come out of that body. Now, you're going to come out of that body, and if you're saved and born again, you're going to go to heaven, and you're going to be faced with things like that. And if you're not saved and born again, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to a, a lake of burning fire for all eternity. And you have right now have the power to come closer to God. You have the power to not be a neighbor. Hey, how you doing over there, Jesus? Yeah, see you around. I'll check you out here next week sometime. Yeah, come over for a cup of coffee. One of these days. Yeah. Or you can be a friend. Yes, here I am. How you doing? Nice seeing you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can be a friend with Jesus, or you can be a neighbor with Jesus. And the big difference is, this is Jesus. John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus. Do you want to be his friend? You talk to your friends. Or do you want us to be his neighbor? Well, I'll talk to you on Sunday. Maybe. I'm not busy. Up to you. In your power. Let's go over to the back page. Now, this is the smallest picture within the big picture within the biggest picture. These are the details now. All these parables that we talk about in Luke 15 all relate to each other. 
And they're all part of each other, okay? This is Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 16. And he said, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And I'm going to interpret as we go. Two saved sons. A certain man is, is God. And he had two sons, two saved sons. And these are types and shadows of the saved, that's the Old Testament persons, and two, the New Testament persons. That's the two sons here we're talking about. Old Testament people and New Testament people. All who are imputed for righteousness, all who are saved. That's what we're going to talk about. And the younger of them, and the younger would be the newest, that's the New Testament. And the New Testament, now we're itemizing it to a guy, okay? And the New Testament guy said of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. Give me the portion. And he's asking for, for the inheritance. Now, inheritance were set up uh, in biblical times uh, that the father uh, would give the eldest son two-thirds of all the, all the property, of the possession, two portions, in other words, and uh, then everybody else divided the rest. So if there were seven people, seven sons, then the elder first son would get two portions, and each of those would, would get a, one portion apiece. Uh, if you, if you, how, which way the mathematics goes, okay? But always a priority was given to the eldest son. That would be, in this case, the Old Testament people who are the eldest son. They're the one longest around, okay? Now let's see what happens here. And a certain man had two sons, and the younger, the New Testament guy, of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods as the substance, the property, the possessions that fall to me. That's a uh, request for his pre-death inheritance. That was done in, the, uh, in, in biblical times to some degree. It was, it was uh, a fairly common thing. Not, all, not really all, all, all together all the time, but a fairly common thing. To, get, to divide up the estate before the guy died, okay, before the father died. And uh, uh, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he, that's God, divided it unto them, to, uh, that is to both the young. Notice the them there. See, I missed that when I used to read this. this. I caught it this time. Them. He divided it into them. In other words, he divided his estate into his two sons. Them. Not just the, not just the one son. And so he gave the, the, the Old Testament son two portions. And he gave the New Testament son his single portion. One, uh, two portions and one portion. Okay? Follow me? Two thirds and one third. And he divided unto them, that's both of them now, both the younger son, one third, and the elder son, two thirds of their inheritance. And the father, in essence, did what? He retired. In the sense of the word, he retired. Okay? He didn't die, but he retired. Okay? Like we do now sometimes, uh, we have a father who, who uh, uh, on a farm or something, and he, he gets hurt or, or, or whatever, and just, just he retires. He's, he turns 65, 70 years old, and he can't do the work anymore, so he retires, and he splits the farm up between his two sons. But he gives the eldest two-thirds of the, of the property possessions, and the younger son one-third. Okay? That happens now. And he divided up to them his living. That's his livelihood, okay? Which is very vague, but it's about God. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, that is, he gathered all the substance of his inheritance together, and took his journey into a far country. And took his journey into a far country. That is, he took a journey far away from the spiritual heavenly culture, which represents the garden, representing the Garden of Eden. That's a spiritual heavenly culture, okay? And into a secular earthly culture, that's the world. So in, in symbol, symbolically, he left the Garden of Eden, the heavenly culture, and went into the world, the uh, secular culture. Okay? And there, wasted his substance with riotous living. Wasted means, in the Greek, it means dissipated. It means separated himself from. He squandered his substance. He scattered his substance with riotous living. Interesting. Riotous means in the Greek unsavedness. Unsavedness. That's pretty interesting. It's excess as well. Okay? And then the Amplified Bible has it loose from restraint. In other words, no restraint on himself. He just went crazy and did whatever he wanted, felt like he wanted to do any time. 
And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. A mighty famine in the Greek is a scarcity of food. Okay? In other words, he went out and partied like crazy. Did all kinds of partying. Then having, for all, when you're spending money, everybody's your friend. Uh, trust me, I know, I did the deal. Okay? They're all your buddy. Even the blocks away, hey, how you doing? Everybody's your friend. Uh, uh, and when you don't have any money, you know, I don't want to see that guy, you know. Anyway. And he spent all and there arose a mighty famine in the land. The famine is a scarcity of food, both physical and spiritual. Okay? That's happening to us right now. Right now, we're experiencing a famine in the land. We're experiencing a physical famine insofar as the crops in like, uh, like 40 some, almost 50% of the population of the United States is getting food stamps right now. Wow. Okay. Uh, and that's really tremendously increased. And, and food's getting scarce and scarce. And all over the world, food's getting harder and harder to come by. Okay. So we're experiencing a physical famine, the beginnings of a physical famine. And it's going to get a lot tougher. And we're experiencing tremendous, a spiritual famine. God, everything from God's going downhill. And the churches are closing. The donations are down. Everybody's out. Uh, nothing's. Out. We got all kinds of garbage going on. Everything. And I mean, not us. I mean everything, all over. All churches are closing. They're combining. That they do. Uh, some just kind of close the doors and, and leave. Uh, most others, they they have they they're combined. They combine their congregation with a larger congregation, which means they close the doors and they want the larger congregation. That's all. All right. And that's happening a lot all over the country. Okay, we're in a decline, and Christians, you know, are, are you, you, we used to make fun of, 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 of black people. We used to make fun of uh, Polish people. We used to make fun of Japanese and uh, Chinese people. You can't do any of that stuff anymore, but you can sure make fun of a Christian. I mean, I tell you, uh, 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 that's the only uh, type of person that you can actually make fun of, uh, 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 derogatory. And nobody thinks nothing of it. But you better not touch anybody else. Try making fun of the Is Islamic people once and see what happens. <laughs> okay. So we're in a crisis situation right now. That's the prophecy. That's, this, is, this is a prophecy here, okay? And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And in want means he needed to suffer need. And uh, uh, now, now, many are now suffering in need, and soon all will suffer need. It's got to come to that. It's got to come to that. Uh, for uh, two reasons, the population is getting uh, bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, the uh, food production is being monopolized by, uh, no, let that go for now. And he began to be in want, and he went, and what he did is this. He joined himself to a citizen of that country. The citizen was unsaved. So because he was in his need and want, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, of that unsaved secular country. And he, that's the unsaved citizen, sent him into his fields to feed swine. Sent him means he controlled the younger son. That's big government now. He controlled the younger son and sent him into the fields to feed swine. Swine are hogs, pigs, unclean, defiled animals. Verboten. Terrible thing to do if you're Jewish to do that. Terrible thing. In fact, Islam as well. Islamic as well. And he sent him into his, fe uh, into, into his fields to feed swine. And I wish I had time. Let me read you this. I am taking time. And this will go pretty. This goes fast at this point. So I'm going to read you something that's really pertinent, that I didn't have room to put in. It's Exodus chapter uh, 1, verses, starts with verse 7. Exodus, where am I going here? Exodus 1. I didn't have room to put this in. This is what happened to them, and it's what's going to happen to us. <coughs> Now listen, that's what this is all about. That's what this Bible is all about. It's prophetic all about. Starts in verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful 
had increased abundantly. These were when they, they lived in, the, in Egypt. This was when the children of Israel were in Egypt, okay, in the land of Goshen. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. That's Christians. Up until a few years ago, that's the deal. 90% of you, uh, are you a Christian? 90% of people say, I'm a Christian in the country right here. They would say that, okay? Where am I? Oh, okay. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph was a, a, a godly uh, uh, man, uh, but uh, this new king was an Assyrian king. And this might be even who knows who. Might have been Obama, might be, might be this uh, fellow we have now, even though he seems to be, uh, you know, uh, appearances are deceiving. Anyway, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel, the Christians now, are more and mightier than we. Come on, lest we, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, that they should join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. It's the beginning of where he wanted to get them out of the They wanted to leave. Anyway. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, this is the great thing, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Oh, that's a great thing. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. That's real hard, stiff, hard things. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Hard, hard, hard. And the king of Egypt spake unto the Hebrew. Well, it's a, uh, that goes on for there's, there's some things. That's the deal that's coming to us as Christians, okay? Eventually, just like it happened in Germany, when they had to have a group, and uh, 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 Hitler had to have a group to come against so he could unify the people against them. He unified the people against the Jews. Well, the Jews are uh, our cousins and uh, our brothers and sisters, actually. Brothers here, all right? And uh, and we're Jews. Who you got? You think living inside you? A fellow named Jesus. He's a Jew. Who's Israel now? Do you think we're Israel? We got Jesus inside us. So ultimately, what's going to happen? The country is going to come against the Christians. It's already has started to, and it's going to come against the Christians, and that's going to happen to us. Again, that's the beginning of it. And I think maybe that might even tie in with uh, uh, being taught with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. Because I believe some of us are going to be raptured out and the rest of us are going to have to be suffer, suffer through that ordeal. Being taught with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. Just like the Israelites were in the Old Testament. And let's, say, let's finish this. Uh, and he said, okay, so the citizen uh, sent him uh, into his fields. That's big government. Sent him into his fields. There you go. There's the deal right there. To feed swine. That's hard, rigorous stuff. For us, uh, uh, well, it was for them, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't put a have to go out and feed the pigs, I don't think, but other things as well, okay? And, and it says about the, about the young man, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. Now, this is really good. And he would feign. Now, feign is, is a word that indicates lust in the Hebrew, okay? So I've written in some stuff, interpretation. He would, in his lust, have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, but he didn't fill his belly. He would have, it says. It didn't say he did. It, it, it could have said, well, and he filled his belly with the, with the husks that the swine didn't say that. And he would, in his lust, have filled, have filled, he would have, is not the same as did. It's, he could have. 
See, he didn't do that. He didn't fill his belly. All right? But now what are the, are the husks with the swine did he eat? There's a footnote number two. Commentary with the husks. Husks are like, like heads of corn, because we can picture it. Or this was barley and other things as well. But let's picture the heads, heads of horn. Husks are the dead decaying outer coverings of the absent nutritious inside seeds. Like corn, when you uh, take a piece of corn now, for example, okay, and the outer covering is all husk. It's all, what do you do with the husk? Nobody eats the husk except the pigs. And I, I've lived on a farm. We give the husk to the pigs. But what happens to the, the corn itself? Every one of those little kernels is a seed, you know. We eat the seeds. That's the nutritious part. But we give the husk to the pigs. That's exactly what happened here. With the husk, and he, and he said, but he would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. The husks are the de dead, decaying outer, outer coverings of the absent inside seeds. Metaphorically, here it is metaphorically, the logos and rhema word of God. The, the corn cob is the logos and rhema word of God. The logos and now it's hard to think like that, equals the husk. That's the outside. That's the word here that we're reading. That's the husk. See, the word here isn't what God's after. He isn't what he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand. He wants us to take in what's inside the word. He wants us to open up the word, the actual word written there in English, sometimes in Spanish, sometimes German, whatever. He wants to open that word up and take and understand what's inside it, eat what's inside of it. The meaning. That's the seed. That's the nutritious seed here, okay? You follow what I'm saying to you? Husk. Okay, so the husk represents the word of God, okay, in this form. This is a husk. I have to break these words down and open them up in order to get the meanings out of them. That's what I do. That's what you do too. You're searching for meanings. The meaning is inside. It's not outside. The meaning is not outside in the husk. The meaning is inside. That's why the Bible says uh, people who re read the Bible don't understand it. It's foolishness unto them. They can't understand it because they're, they're looking for the meaning on the outside. The meaning that God wants us to receive is on the inside. He wants us to receive the seed, the kernels of corn. Okay. And so then, here's the breakdown. The, lo the husk, uh, the logos word is, is the husk, but the rhema word, which is revelations, equals the seed. Now, can he get saved and born again by eating the husk? The husk. No, you can't do that. You've got to eat the seed to get saved and born again. I can prove it to you. Turn back to the front of the page. Underneath my heading I have this, this verse from Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That word, word, over there, W-R-D, is rhema. It's not logos. It's rhema. The whole source of the seed parable is written on the, in the Bible in logos. Okay? The whole Bible is logos. But this word here is rhema. That's revelations. You've got to have the revelations to get the faith. How do you get the faith? By reading the logos? Well, anybody can read the logos. There's no faith in that. It's the rhema. It's the meaning. You've got to take the seed in and eat the seed. And if you do that, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. The revelations of God. That's why I pray in the beginning that each of you receive a revelation from God. That's the meaning inside. Now that looks kind of terrible when we talk about the husk being uh, a decaying and whatever, but that's the actual fact of the matter, okay? In, this, in that metaphor, this is what we want. We want the rhema. We want to eat the seed. That's what we want to eat. Praise God.
Okay, where am I? <laughs> oh, it's the front page. Okay, now, and I final up that, it says here, and he would have fain have filled his belly. He didn't, of course, but he would have, could have, his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And then it says this, and no man gave unto him. Now well, here he is, this guy. He's so broke, he sent out to feed pigs. And he's so broke, he does it. Okay, he's so hungry and horrible. And, he, and he's given all his money, all his inheritance to everybody, just throwing it out right and left and partying here and partying there, everything else with, with all kinds of things going on. And now he's broke and he, help me. And the Bible says, and no man would help him. And no man would help him. Now, it didn't say God wouldn't help him, but it said no man would help him. And he, he would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Here's the parenthetically I have. No man returned anything now in his to him in his time of need. Not even a token of the smallest of the younger son's previous largesse. That's the French word for generous giving. People he'd given all kinds of stuff to wouldn't give him back a penny or a cent or nothing or nothing. And I learned that to be a fact, too. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, I learned the good. Okay, thank you, Lord. Put me through lots and lots of stuff. <laughs> lots and lots of stuff. That's the truth. Now, then we go to Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 24. And when he came to himself, now remember, this guy's out there supposed to be eating the husks, that, uh, and the, he's in the pig pen, and he's in there feeding the pigs and, 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 and trying to get something himself. And it says, and when he came to himself, what that means is he's like this, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, what am I doing here? And when he came to himself, okay, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have enough bread, have bread enough and, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my, so on and so on. He, he came to himself, he's going to go back to his father. Now, there's another instance that happened as well. Let's go to the first footnote here on that. Luke chapter 8, verse 35. There was a wild man, the, the demonic of the garden age. This guy was wild. He was crazy. He was running around. He was naked. He tore his clothes. They tried to put clothes on him. He tore his clothes off. He was yelling, screaming, shouting, and uh, uh, all kinds of... And he lived in the tombs in the graveyard, okay? And he had 6,000 demons inside of him. They called legion. He just asked him, 6,000 bad thoughts <laughs> inside him. Because, well, angels are bad thought, but uh, anyway. And so we pick it up here right toward the end of that, Luke chapter 8, verse 35. And, it would, and when he came to Jesus, he actually ran to Jesus when he saw him. I mean, he didn't just come to Jesus. He, he ran. He knew he needed it because he couldn't do it himself. He couldn't. That's why he was with stones doing this to himself all day long trying to breaking stones and cutting the flesh, trying to get those demons out of them. Couldn't do it. You can't do it. It's not physical. It's spiritual. So when he saw Jesus, he ran to him. That was his only way out. Jesus healed him. I got rid of the demons, okay? And then what happened is the townspeople came out, and this is what happened then. Uh, and then they, the townspeople, went out to see what was done, and, it came, and they came to, and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, that's the, the previously wild man, out of whom the devils, that's the demons, legion, Mark 5.15, were departed. The man was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, because he was naked before, he couldn't do nothing. He was clothed, that indicates he was tamed, he was domesticated. We're all clothed today. If you took your clothes off, you'd wander around here, you'd all be wild people, right? Well, maybe we'd have one or two wild people here. They'd be naked, running around, uh, all that stuff. Now you get the point. And the man was clothed, and, in, and what does it say? And he was and in his right mind. Amen. Think about that, what that means. He was in his right mind. That's the same thing as what this, this guy said. And when he came to himself, the other guy in the pig pen, but now this other guy, this demon infested guy, he, was, he came with Jesus, he killed of Jesus, and he was in his right mind. Boy, don't you want to be in your right mind? I mean, get rid of all that garbage because we still got lots of garbage in us. We all need to be clean because we've got these uh, bad thoughts, 
Bad thoughts are demonic thoughts from the from uh, their fallen angels. We got stuff living around inside of it. Can't get rid of that stuff. And when he came to himself, and this guy, he was in his right mind, in his right mind. Praise God, praise God. That's where we are now. We're sitting here going through this kind of ordeal with me up here yelling at you, okay? Uh, but it's, uh, but you're you're getting closer and closer to being in your right mind because of it. You are. Every little bit, here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little, all counts, every little bit. If you receive one revelation today from God, one new thought from God, revelation from God, wow, man, you made it, you really got a gain. That's just one. Okay, and he says here, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. See, he says, he's saying to himself now. So in other words, these are thought, he's having thoughts of, his, of, his, of a confession to, to, to his father, which would be God. Okay. And so he says, I will go to my father and say, I will arise. I'm going to do this. I go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. These are thoughts of a confession. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So this indicates that the son finally has had good found good intentions. Okay, He has good intentions. He hasn't done anything yet. He just thought about it finally. He came, came to himself and he thought about it. Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to my father and confess to him that I've been a sinner and I need help. And that, that. But he didn't do anything yet. So that was good intentions. And he arose. Oh, here we go. Now he's doing it. And he arose and came to his father, which means parenthetically, and he did as he intended, which is not always the case. How many times do we have good intentions? How many times have you woken up in the morning or gone to bed at night and it's supposed to come to church the next day? Well, I, I, I want to come to church. I want to come to church. I want to come to church. Wound up not getting up, not coming to church. Good intentions. We don't always follow our good intentions. And that isn't just in church, it's in everything. Okay? But this guy had good intentions, he had good thoughts, and he did it. That's what we got to do. We got to do it. All right? And he arose and came to his father. But when he, now notice this. Notice what happens here. But when he was yet a great way off, a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. So the father's been sitting up there in a type of shadow, in a type of heaven, watching everything that's going on. And when the, the, the young man, young son starts to come back to him, the father saw him, when he was a great way off still, and ran to him. He didn't go to him before, when he was messing around doing this and that in riotous living. He didn't come to him then or anything, but now that the kid says, I want to go visit my father, he didn't come to him then either when he, had the, when he said that good expression of intention. He only came to the kid when the kid was coming to him. What does that mean? I could never figure that out. Let's go to the second footnote here. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Amen. Isn't that something? I get chills just now from that. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And that's exactly what happened there. He didn't come to the kid when he was out in the, in the mud pits, without doing all his righteous living, he didn't come to God. He sat, sat watching, he didn't come to God when he was in the, in the, in the, in the pit with the pigs, and, 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 which was bad for him, he still didn't come to him. And then, come to, and then the kid makes a decision. He thinks, I'm going to go and do and make a confession to my father. And then he comes to him then. But when the younger son was coming to him, was actually doing what he said he was going to do, father came to him to meet him. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, 
and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. How are you going to do that? Cleanse, 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 cleanse your, your hands and, and purify your hearts. Here's how, parenthetically. How can we draw near to God? Answer, with the washing of the water by the word. That's Ephesians 5.26, or quote from Ephesians 5.26. But with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of water to cleanse us by the word of God. Okay, and then I have here, read it! That's how you come closer to God. This is water. As I'm reading it, I'm being cleansed, I'm being washed. As you read it, you're being cleansed, you're being washed, you're being washed, you're being purified. Draw nigh to God. That's it. Now, if I just kept my Bible like that, big deal, nothing happening. But I opened it up, I start reading, I'm drawing closer to God. He says he's drawing closer to us when we do that. Not when we think about it. And I'm sitting over here and think about doing that. He ain't doing nothing. He ain't doing nothing until I do something. Until I open this Bible and start reading it. And you should read the New Testament first. He wants you to take it all in. He wants you to take it all in so you can get all the revelations. And if you're going to do that, start with the New Testament first. Read all the New Testament first. Then read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament first. Because if you read the Old Testament first, you see a lot of killing, a lot of bad things happening. It doesn't make any sense to you at all what a good, good that God can do that. But if you read the New Testament, you understand that God's a, a, a husbandman. John uh, 15 says, Father God is a husbandman. That's a farmer, okay? And when he does, he's planted a crop uh, in, this, in this world. That's us, okay? And he wants it to grow. But he's also... Uh, the, uh, the enemy came along and planted a bad crop, bad seed, okay, in this world. So we got the good seed God planted and the bad seed that the enemy planted growing together. And God's allowing those two to grow together because the bad seed is, how will I say, making us stronger. Making us stronger. Coming against us. Giving us a hard time. Persecuting us. The more they uh, afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they multiplied and grew. God's got a purpose. And all those things that happened in the Old Testament, for those, even the kids that were killed and wiped out, the whole families and whole towns were wiped out. So what does that mean? God's a farmer. All right, he planted seed in a garden. Now he's got some weeds growing too. That's unsaved people, weeds. So he's got some good, some saved people growing, because we're all growing still, and he's got some unsaved people growing. Those are weeds. What do you do with weeds? Well, you pluck them, and you throw them over to the side of the, side of the garden. And you pluck them and throw them over the side of, you pull them up and throw them over the side of the garden, and then you burn them. Well, why not just throw them over the side of the garden and leave them there? Well, because they'll grow again. They'll grow right there. So what you do is you burn them. That's what he does. That's what the lake of consuming fire is for. Hellfire. Burn them. Wasn't that great? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Isn't that something? That was, a, that was the primary revelation uh, for this message that I had. <laughs> It just came to me. Like, I never knew that before. I always wondered, well, how come God just, the type of God just sits there and watches all this stuff happen to his kid out there? And even the kid starts coming to him, and, and, and then all of a sudden he gets up and decides to go, well, what's, what's that all about? And then the verse came to me. The answer came, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. And, then, and how, to, how to draw nigh to God? This is God. You read it, you're drawn nigh. Praise God. Praise God. I'm sure as I was. Okay, yeah, I want to finish this now. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. That's what we lacked, compassion. 
compassion, as Jesus Christ said, compassion. Yeah. Had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned. Now he's making an actual confession. Before he was thinking about the confession. Now he's making the confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. He spoke the confession now, Romans 10, 9, okay? And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now I refer again to, uh, but let a man examine himself that he was already covered. I told you, that in these, in these uh, parables, these three parables are interrelated. This refers back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, and 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We talked to, uh, let a man examine himself. He did. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. That's true, okay? Me too, you too. But the father said to the servants, now would be the angels in the, in the following context, the angels. Only the angels could do this. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And the best robe is the white robe of righteousness. Bring, that's a covering. A robe is a covering. And the covering is the white robe of righteousness. That's the best robe. Okay. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring. That's, that's why he comes back in the cloud. Uh, Jesus in the cloud. Those are all white robe saints in a white cloud. In a white cloud. White robe saints. And put, it, and, and put it on him and put a ring. That's a ring of authority in this time. You had a ring with a signet in it. It was a ring of authority on his hand. And shoes on his feet. That's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Ephesians 6.15 again. Okay. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. Well, what is that? If he was dead and alive again, if he was dead, then he had to have been born, right, to become dead. Yeah, things just don't just appear dead. You have to be born to become dead. She was born, and then this my son was dead, and is alive again. That means he was born again, right? That's what that means. Right there, right in front of us, he's saying, he was born again. That's you and me, born again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now let's go down to the, the, the section here we're dealing with the elder son. Luke chapter 15, verse 25 through 32. Now his elder son, that's a, he was an Old Testament Jew, symbolizing all imputed for righteousness Old Testament Jews. Okay? They were imputed for righteousness and saved. We're imputed for righteousness as well. Okay, now his elder son was in the field. That was, he was walking in, in Old Testament faith. Okay? In the field. And he came and drew nigh. That's James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. And that's what happened right here too again. And he came and drew nigh to the house. That's the New Testament church. So this is a Jew that came near to the New Testament church. Okay? And he heard the music and dancing, the merriment. And he called one of the servants, who are the angels, called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the angel said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father, ha thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And that means be, be well in body, figuratively, to be uncorrupt in true doctrine. True doctrine, okay, not corrupt. And this, the Jew, the, 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 the older son, and he was angry. And you know, most of them still are. Most of the Jewish people are still angry uh, with, with, uh, with Jesus Christ and with, with uh, New Testament Christianity. Okay? And they still are trying to follow the Old Testament. And he was angry and would not go in. See, and they won't go in. They won't, they won't be converted. He didn't, he didn't want to experience a New Testament joy. They won't, they won't be converted. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. His father came out and entreated him, pleaded with him. And he answering said to his father, this is the Jewish uh, elder son said, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. I've been perfectly following your commandments, which they tried to do. Okay. And yet thou never gavest me a kid. That's, even, that's not a fatted calf, but a, but a small goat or something, okay? That I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, okay? That would, that would be idolatry, false doctrines. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf, and the, God said, Son, thou art ever with me. Notice that now he's talking to an Old Testament Jew. Thou art ever with me, and all I have is thine. Notice in the beginning, he gave him 
two thirds, two portions of, of his of his uh, uh, livelihood, the Old Testament Jew. He said to him, "Son, thou art ever with me. All I have that is thine. It is meat that is fitting. It's just that the Old Testament, the Old Testament Jew didn't understand. It is fitting. That, uh, it is meat. It's fitting that we should be make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. A repeat again. And what does dead alive again mean? Born again. Again. All throughout these verses, there, there's, there's repeats, okay? And was lost and is found. John 15. Oh, excuse me, John. Luke 15. That's quite a trip, wasn't it? I mean, that was quite a trip. From the, the, the big picture to the lesser but still big picture of the big picture of the world to the uh, still big picture of the house to the smaller more detailed picture of the two sons God speaking to you the quotations the blackface was God speaking to you through me through me I'm an instrument. And you are too. Are you being used by God? Are you being used by God as an instrument for God? No glory for me. No glory. There's an instrument right there. No glory for him. Glory for God. We're instruments for God. It's a wonderful thing. See, we don't want to be neighbors. We don't want to be neighbors. We want to be friends with God. Enoch was counted a friend of God. And so Abraham, actually. Friends of God. We we'll want to be friends with God. You can be a friend with God, too. You just got to pay attention to God. How do you do that? Well, here he is. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again. And we've seen that emphasized twice now. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot experience God unless you become born again. That's what that means. It means nothing. I mean, you won't get anything out of it. All you're doing, if you're not born again, you can read the Bible a hundred times, and all you're doing is you're eating the husks. You're eating the husks. But you're never eating the seed. And you can read the Bible a hundred times. I know people, Isaac Asimov, a, a, a famous physicist, a scientist, science fiction writer, uh, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, another a brilliant uh, both Jewish fellows read the Bible, wrote critiques on the Bible. <laughs> Meaningless. They didn't get it at all. All they were getting was the husks. They didn't get the rhema, the revelation, because they weren't born again. Look at you. See, I'm talking about famous, tremendously wealthy people here who wrote whole things on the Bible, whole books on the Bible, and, and didn't get it. Because they ate the husks. And look at you. If you're born again, you're eating the rhema, the revelations of God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, the Apostle Paul explained it in Romans 10, 9. He said this. This is how you can become born again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess means say something out loud. A prayer out loud. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And. There's an and here now. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. If you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on this cross 
and paid the penalty for all your sins and was resurrected, and you're willing to say the prayer at the beginning, you're born again saved person. All the people that were lost were found. All the sheep that were lost were found. All the sheep will always be found because the sheep were already saved, born again. And if they wander off, they're going to be found. So that's your security. Your security. Because you're going to have doubts. I had doubts. I still have some doubts. But then as I continue to read, my doubts were explained to me through revelations. So anyone here who would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time, please raise your hand and I'll say a prayer with you. I'll say the prayer first and you can say it after me. Anyone here at all like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time? For the first time. Okay. That's an opportunity. What will happen to you if you died tonight? Anybody here could die tonight? Anybody here could die this afternoon? I could have a heart attack right here now. You too. You could die. Meteor could come down. Uh, the ceiling could fall. You walk, walk out and the car could run over you. And you're dead. Where would you go? Where would you go? If you can't say right away, I go to heaven, man, you need to get born again. Because that's the only people who can say, I'm going to go to heaven. Bang. Born again people. Where would you go? Anybody here want to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Anyone at all? We have an internet congregation. Yes, I... Brett, you're many times saved. Okay. <laughs> God bless you, Brett. We have an internet, internet congregation. This message is going out to every, first, every, every country in the world right now, and we'll continue to do so for the next uh, week, 24-7. So they can raise their hand if they'd like to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I'm going to say the prayer. How many people here would like to speak to God? Please raise your hand. If you'd like to speak to God, let's pray. Well, you want to pray over there? Raise your hand. All right, that's good. That's good. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me. Okay? As I say the prayer, say it with me, and say it for the people out there in the internet congregation. For us, it's, it's a, it's, I know it's going to be a hard concept for you to grasp, but we're angels. <laughs> you just don't know it yet, but we're angels. Okay? We're going to be like a chorus of heavenly angels. Now, I'll explain that sometime to you. Okay. Praising the Lord, saying this prayer. Let's all say it now, shall we? Good. And with some gusto, uh, uh, God's here, uh, the, the Holy Spirit's here, Jesus Christ is here, and the angels are here. They're all here. Yes. Listening to you. Father God. Father God. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died, on died on the cross and paid the penalty, paid the penalty for, all for all my sins and was resurrected. Was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, God, Father God, please send your son, send your, son your seed, your, seed, your, fire, your fire, your light, your, light, your love, into my heart, into my heart. To, be to be the Lord and Savior, Savior. Of, my life. of my life. Thank you, Father God. You, Father God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Please be seated. Please be seated. Ronnie, would you come forward, please, and take the tithes and offerings? Ronnie's going to take tithes and offerings. And then we're going to have a prayer for the uh, uh, food we're about to partake of. And I, I know that uh, we mostly all stood up. Uh, not everyone said the prayer. And we just need to just 
pray for those people. And a number of them have left already on top of it. All right? We just need to pray for those people that they'll come into an understanding. It's, it's that they don't understand. <laughs> just, but you have to be willing to understand. If you're not willing to understand, you'll never understand. You have to be willing to bend the knee and submit yourself to God, to Jesus Christ, at the cross. You have to be willing to do that. If you're not willing to do that, submit yourself to higher authority, never be saved, never be born again. Amen. 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 What is the, the keynote verse? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Wow, wasn't that something? Wow, man. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And he did it right before our very eyes in the text of the, of, of the Bible. Thank you, Roni. Father God, Lord, we thank you for blessing us with this word today. Lord, we ask that you just bless the ears, every ear that heard this word, Lord, and let it, let it go down into their hearts and let it take root and uh, bring you great joy and delight. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Brother, would you stand, Dan, stand and say uh, this prayer for us? Oh, bless the food we're about to partake of. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the word that you've given us today that we can absorb that. Father, we're grateful for the food that we're about to partake today that we absorb that. That both would make us strong, Father, and that we can serve you. That we can honor you, Father, and glorify you with everything that we do. We praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless God. Hallelujah. Join us for the fellowship meal coming up. Thank you.